conventional fitness advice is to eat six times a day with frequent snacks and you know make them all low low fat and higher in protein and such but uh, what they don't tell you is that that may not have like a pro longevity benefit on them uh, just because of like stimulating mTOR quite frequently and mm-hmm. uh, you know maintaining this anabolism and not, not going into autophagy and such so that's gonna be like a really <laughs> detrimental situation it's gonna be simply like people aren't aware Hey everyone, Jeff Wu here again, and welcome to the HVMN podcast. If you're tuning in, you're probably just as passionate about human optimization as we are. Whether that's through diet, exercise, nootropics, cutting edge biotechnology, there's a ton of levers we can all pull to become better versions of ourselves. Seem Lund, a biohacker and high performance coach, has been experimenting with many of these levers through his life and has been recently sharing his knowledge and experiments through his YouTube channel and podcast. While he has dabbled in many biohacks, his bread and butter interventions, or should I say, just butter, are keto and intermittent fasting. Seem and I touch upon the intuitive feeling of being in ketosis and how you might not need to just rely on ketone monitors as you become more experienced with ketosis, how the ketogenic diet and intermittent fasting are quite synergistic, and what changes in biomarkers like IGF-1 might mean when eating a higher fat diet. Seem, great to have you on the program. Yeah, great uh, that you're having me, and it's been been, a, been watching your show quite, for quite a while and uh, enjoyed the episodes. No, awesome, thank you. So who are you dialing in from? I know that it's... Uh, we're in different time zones, so it'd be helpful to give our our listeners here a context of where you're based and and, and your background there. Yeah, um, uh, I am from uh, the cold, wintry regions of Estonia, f- calling in from at the moment. And uh, yeah, you, I'm mostly based in Estonia, and I live on this one island called called Sarema, which uh, translates into basically an island, <laughs> and and that's where I kind of was born, and that's where I live most of the time as well. But uh, I, I recently came from uh, the Los Angeles as well, from the Metabolic Hill Summit. So I do kind of travel around quite often. Yeah. So folks that aren't familiar with Seam, you've become quite a biohacking experimenter, looking at things like intermittent fasting, different hardware interventions and, and wearables to things like cryotherapy and all of that. And I thought that given that we're both fairly, you know, N equals one guinea pig biohackers, that would be fun to just kick off the conversation with going down the list of different things we've all experimented with and give our thoughts about them. Whether we think they're great, whether we think the science is good, whether we felt personal, subjective, or quantitative improvements from those biohacks. And also, what are interventions we think are overhyped, less legitimate, maybe on the side of quackery or pseudoscience. Right. Um, so that, that could be a first thing to start. And I noticed that we both are wearing aura rings so these are sleep tracking, heart rate variability rings. Um, curious to get your thoughts, and then I'll, I'll give you my thoughts. I think that I got the first generation Aura ring as well. So uh, I would say that it is one of my kind of favorite biohacking technology devices that I use, just because of it's very like practical. It's not like some sort of a, you know a woohoo thing <laughs> that uh, doesn't have like real science behind it it's it's, sim- it's simply a means of uh, improving your sleep quality so that itself can have like a compounding effect on everything else you do as well like your productivity or your mental focus and even like the emotion you feel during the day so i would say that e- even simply having the ring kind of puts you this sort of a mode where you're being mindful about your sleep quality whereas uh, in other cases you may be simply going into this sort of a path. You're going, you may go down the path of not being uh, that careful with your sleep quality and you don't really know how, how well you sleep during night. So the Aura Ring simply gives you like a really good quantifiable feedback about how well do you sleep at all and uh, how much deep sleep are you particularly getting. And uh, yeah, a lot of people who maybe pick up the ring in the first place uh, they initially they definitely see that oh, oh I'm not actually getting an, any REM sleep or I'm not I'm not getting any kind of deep sleep at all. So I, I personally have found that to be like really simply even just just the fact of having it that's gonna give you like more responsibility over your kind of sleep quality. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I think even just on a practical matter, I think there's a lot of wearables one can wear these days where that's a. Apple Watch or a Fitbit. And I just found that the ring form factor just 
much more convenient. You know, I like kind of sleeping and rolling around a little bit and having a big watch that you're wearing that need, you need to charge every single day is a little bit cumbersome. So just even aside from the data side around heart rate variability, uh, projecting out REM sleep, deep sleep, what you mentioned, I think just the practicality of a ring is just a nice little uh, device. Yeah, you're right. Like you don't really even notice it when you're wearing it and uh, the ring kind of looks cool as well. So if you have like some sort of a cool, uh, if you have like the black ring, uh, then it, it may also turn some eyes or turn some heads and people are going to ask about well, what kind of a thing is that? Yeah. <laughs> Quite funny thing that we also, a few, a few years ago, one of my friends and I were thinking about, yeah, maybe we're going to intercept the market and we're going to create like a tow ring as well. <laughs> that's going to attract your sleep. So it, that would be like the Torah. But uh, at the moment, it's, that's not have been uh, put into practice. Yeah. I've seen that you've experimented with a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen chamber. And uh, we had Dr. Scott Schur on our program talking about hyperbaric oxygen chamber. So I had some experiences with that as well. Curious to hear about your thoughts on hyperbaric oxygen and um, your subjective you know, thoughts on, that, on it. I would say that, yeah, it, it, it has like a bunch of uh, research that supports the benefits of hyperbaric uh, oxygen chamber. Uh, but I myself haven't done it like that much to see like any kind of significant difference. I've done it only like a few times because like there isn't a chamber in Estonia. There's only the nearest ones are probably like in uh, London or uh, Stockholm or somewhere. Uh, but um, I would say that uh, how effective it's going to be is going to depend upon o only your kind of personal levels of oxidative stress and inflammation and, and such. So um, e even I, I personally, I don't really experience like a lot of chronic inflammation or chronic stress. So I'm quite living in, you know, quite a clean environment already with, you know, fresh air and uh, sunlight. So I haven't noticed that much difference from that. I funny, I think we are matching up on our, on our subjective experiences from this as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there are like actual billable medical indications for hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Uh, you know, there's different diseases and, 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 and uh, sort of injury states that hyperbaric oxygen chambers are, you know, in, in the medical handbook for standard care. But in terms of like a healthy person, like you or I going in there for enhancement or longevity benefits, um, it was not immediately obvious, but I, I personally didn't measure that many biomarkers before or after. We did do some finger sticks for blood glucose and blood ketones. And then um, I think I got a mild elevation of blood ketones, but that might just be because I was didn't, I mean, you know, I was fasting in, inside the oxygen chamber for, you know, an hour or so. And I'm fairly fat adapted. So it went from, you know, something like point three to point four or something, you know, something mild. So I think that might just be noise. Um, acutely, in terms of mental clarity, I mean, some of the theoretical benefits is that, you know, you get hyper oxygenated because you're in 100% oxygen at, you know, you know, one, two, you know, two and a half atmospheres of pressure. Uh, the thought there, the mechanism action there is that you get more oxygen into your brain. Um, I'm not sure if I felt acutely smarter or sharper, maybe a little bit placebo, but it was just like not as an acute as some other interventions. I'm curious to hear if that, that seems you know consistent with your experience. Yeah, I think the uh, benefits are maybe like 1% to 5% to something along the lines of for, for healthy people who are already quite optimized, so to say. Uh, someone who maybe suffers from some sort of a disease like cancer or, or something else, they may definitely experience a much greater benefit from that. Uh, but yeah, I would say that if your kind of pillar stones or the fundamentals aren't that well optimized then you will definitely may benefit from it just because it's going to help you to get it's going to help you to reach the baseline so to say but if you're already functioning from a baseline on a consistent basis then uh, you're not going to go to uh, like a magnificent next level just because you're like uh, your fundamentals are already quite optimized yeah i mean i think to give the steel man argument or the best possible argument for the hyperbaric oxygen folks uh you know you know, Dr. Schur and, and some of the advocates around hyperbaric oxygen chambers did mention that, you know, you need multiple, you know, uh, sessions over a consistent period of time to really get hyper oxygenated. So uh, maybe we just did it too few times and too inconsistently to really see that market measure improvement. But it seemed like he was citing towards some data, I believe, in China where they're doing studies and, 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 do, and did see improved 
test taking performance and I believe a Chinese student population. So um, I, I, so it sounds like, you know, we didn't necessarily see like an acute crazy benefit off of a one, you know, ad hoc use, but maybe uh, it's possible that over consistent use, you know, you might see a benefit there. Yeah. If I had like a chamber at my home, then I would yeah, definitely. I'd be doing it. Uh, yeah. I'd be, I'd be using it. Yeah. yeah. Same. Uh, it's not cheap. So, uh, you know, you know, listeners out there, this is not something that, you know, do your homework if you if you want to experiment there because it's not necessarily a cheap thing because these are pretty expensive, serious medical devices that uh, you got to be playing into. Although I believe I've seen people make sort of homebrew uh, different hyperbaric chambers, which may not may or may not have like 100% oxygen, which is a fire hazard, and then um, to they're, they're like plastic bags as opposed to like steel containers um so it's so definitely not something trivial to to do to do yourself because if you're doing 100 percent oxygen again that's a fire hazard that thing is explosive and then two um how do you contain uh increased atmosphere pressures is not trivial yeah it's much easier to make your own ice bath <laughs> yeah 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 exactly and i think that's a nice segue uh curious to hear about your thoughts of cryotherapy versus heat shock therapy, like sauna, infrared saunas, uh, uh, steam rooms. Curious to hear thoughts of cold versus hot. Do you use both? Do you use them strategically? Uh, how do you incorporate uh, temperature deltas in, in, your, in your protocol? Yeah, like I would say the sauna and uh, ice lake swimming are like the original biohacks of these Nordic uh, countries like Estonia, Finland and uh, Russia and, and so on. So uh, I do, I'm a huge fan of those and I think that they are actually one of the most effective quote-unquote biohacks, although they're simply like traditional medicine or like folk practice yeah. in these parts of the world. Uh, I usually maybe go to the sauna for uh, two to three times a week uh, and uh, I, I really think that kind of the optimal range for the temperature is somewhere around like 70 to 90 degrees celsius which in fahrenheit i would say is like 200 or something uh that's 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 sort of like like the sweet spot yeah. where i oh, yeah like 100 celsius is 212 fahrenheit so yeah i mean but yeah i mean you're getting up there that's hot like it's probably around like 150 to 180 degrees fahrenheit for folks in yeah. yeah, I would say that, that that's a good dose because uh, it's not going to be that uh, stinging hot or burning hot, but at the same time, it's still going to make you sweat a whole lot and it is like mildly discomfortable. So uh, that, that's that's the kind of the main idea that I think that's where most of the benefits are also coming from. Like you have to actually make it slightly uncomfortable, but at the same time, you don't want to co trigger like a fight or flight response and become stressed out because... That's simply going to negate most of the benefits. Yeah. So, what do you typically use heat for versus cold? Uh, how how nuanced or, or or you know do you use them strategically or do you just use them? Yeah, sort of ad hoc. Yeah. If I were to take like a sauna, then uh, I usually try to go expose myself to the cold as well in some form. At the moment, it's the winter, so there's snow around, and I can you know literally take a sauna for maybe ten to fifteen minutes. And then go outside, sit in the snow for a few minutes as well. And that's going to be an amazing kind of the contrast effect where you're going from this heat into the, into the, like the very cold. And uh, it feels, feels quite phenomenal. And I would say that the, kind of, the combination of those things is much better than doing them separately just because of it stimulates the lymph flow much more effectively with that. So after you go back into the sauna from outside, from the cold, then you're going to feel this massive surge of blood flow and uh, it feels feels really, really something different and really, I'm a huge fan of that. I'm a more of a heat person than a cold person, mainly due to the fact that it's easier for me to get access to a steam room or a sauna. I mean, the gym I go to in San Francisco, there is a steam room in there so I can get access to the heat and um, I guess I could, you know, do an ice bath, but it's not, I, I, I'm not in Estonia where there's just like, you know, an ice lake for me to just plunge into. Um, but I'm curious to get your thoughts on the literature. So uh, I think there's been studies, well, there's been studies on ice baths alone or cold alone and heat alone. I don't know if, the, ha have you seen studies on and doing them together where you just cycle hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Um, 
Because I think if you look at some of the mechanisms of actions of cold versus what you expect from heat, they're kind of almost cancel each other out where the cold is really designed for uh, reducing inflammation, reducing adaptation to the metabolic stress of exercise, for example, and heat really sort of doubles down on the metabolic stresses of exercise. And, and but I think you brought up an interesting point of can you increase the lymph flow and the blood flow? But I'm not sure if people have actually studied that as an actual intervention versus just heat alone or just cold alone. So just curious to hear, you know, aside from, I think, the folk tradition, which I think is interesting, have you seen if there's data between cycling, cotton cold versus hot alone or cold alone? Unfortunately, I haven't uh, noticed anything like specific in terms of like the contrast of hot and cold. Uh, but I do think that some of the benefits do coincide with each other. Like uh, the inflammation reduction also happens in the sauna uh, just just because of like, uh, lo- like sweating out some of the toxins as well and uh, boosting the growth hormone and such. Yeah. But uh, n- like the metabolic metabolic side uh, maybe the cold itself wouldn't like trigger the same metabolic responses as as, uh, as the sauna, uh, but at the same time it still helps to kind of convert the white fat into brown fat, which itself still kind of mimics some of the physiology of exercise. Fair enough. I would just I think caution that you, depending on what you want to do, if you want to recover for a sports match the next day, you probably want to end up with cold. If you want to just maximal, maximally adapt to uh, the exercise and have the growth hormone, as you said, you probably want to end up on heat. And maybe if you just do cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, and then you, and you end at the intervention that you want to optimize, whether that's for recovery or for adaptation, that might be just a little bit extra level of nuance as opposed to just let's just do everything and not really understand how these all, things interact. There is definitely like a specific time where I would want to do this uh, hot and cold thing. Uh, if I'm coming from like a workout, resistance training workout, then I definitely don't want to expose myself to the cold because the cold will shut down the hyp- hypertrophy response. Exactly, exactly. Usually if I do the hot and cold and I'm doing it on a, on a rest day just to uh, do some metabolic exercise without like causing actually any, any like additional stress on the body and at the same time, uh, promote recovery from the cold. So uh, yeah, usually if I'm working out, then I'm only taking like some sort of a you know warmer steam room or a sauna. And if I'm having a rest day and if I want to promote recovery, then I will take the cold as well. That's exactly how I I use hot and cold. So uh, you hit it spot on for how I use that use that as well. So anything I'm, I'm trying to maximize adaptation, maximize growth hormone, I'm just going into the in, into the into the heat. Throwing everything uh, into the into the frying pan, so to say, doesn't doesn't really give you like the results. Yeah, very opposite adaptations. And I think, but I think you're right. Like I've done this cycling. I was at a um, sort of this like retreat center down in. Uh, uh, where is it? It's near like Pebble Beach, um, oh, basically just south of San Francisco area. And uh, I was just doing like, you know, cycles of hot and cold, hot and cold. And it's like, it just feels subjectively nice, I think, just from the contrast. But I think it'd be interesting if we actually did some randomized controlled trials on exactly the biomarker effects of hot, cold cycles versus just cold alone or heat alone. An energy source that contains no caffeine, sugar, salt, or carbs, HVM and Ketone is a ketone ester drink that improves physical, cognitive, and metabolic performance. Beyond its application in professional sport, HVM and Ketone is compliant with and supports intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. One bottle equals elevated ketone levels of three to six millimolar for four to six hours. This is deep ketosis in a bottle. From March 11th to March 17th, 2019, we are offering a free yawn, our nootropic for sleep with the purchase of HVM and ketone. Whether you're buying a three pack or a 12 pack, we'll throw in a bottle of yawn to optimize your sleeping and waking habits. With daylight savings having an impact on your circadian rhythm, this is a time sensitive offer saving you $25 that you don't want to miss. Visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to activate the deal. The link is also in the show notes. And now back to the program. You just came back from the Metabolic Health Summit, which is very much into ketogenic diet, low carb diets, intermittent fasting. Uh, tell me about your experimentations. What's your protocol of fasting, uh, dietary restriction, uh, all things that you put 
you know, through their digestive system. Well, I've been doing some form of intermittent fasting for like seven years since high school. So uh, mm. uh, that's kind of my, 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 my kind of favorite nutritional hacks and ways of eating. And uh, I, didn't, I haven't really gone back to like a regular three square meals a day ever since that. How'd you, how'd you get started? How'd you, you know, you're a high schooler. How'd you decide to just eat weird? Yeah, I started lifting weights as well at that time and simply wanted to know, like, how do you get shredded faster? So that's, uh, that's, that's when YouTube was also starting to become more popular. And I maybe stumbled upon some videos that talked about the 16-8 uh, type of uh, lean gains method mm. where you fast for 16 hours and eat within eight hours. So you basically maybe have like two meals or something. And yeah, that, that's what I was doing for several years actually and it was really really effective uh, in terms of like i noticed the huge difference in uh you know mental clarity through, throughout the day and uh, lower inflammation and everything and probably the best benefit is that you don't become so attached to food and you have like this more mental capacity to focus on other stuff and then moving into ketogenic diet i started it off as a like an simply an ex- experiment to try it out because i heard like some amazing benefits from like anti-cancer or you know uh, and such i don't have cancer or any, any disease but i simply was curious about okay i'll try it out and uh, we'll see what happens uh, the first first weeks were somewhat like different i did notice Again, some of the similar benefits in terms of like mental clarity and more cognition, uh, but I I, st- I I didn't like even lose any strength or physical performance during the time either. So I kind of stuck with it, and uh, I just simply I just enjoyed like the foods. I enjoyed, you know, the reduced hunger and increased satiety. So it kind of goes back to for me. Uh, it goes back to like maintaining productivity throughout the day and not being so kind of <laughs> attached to food and not being dependent of, of constantly frequently eating. And keto diets make fasting so much easier as well. Yeah. You, you don't, the kind of the fat adaptation that occurs from keto, the, the same kind of coincides with the fat adaptation you get from intermittent fasting. So that's one of my kind of perfect combo in my opinion. And after, after having gone through it for like several years, then uh, I don't really have to be kind of worried about eating carbs either. Like uh, I've built up the metabolic flexibility and uh, fat burning machinery so I can really easily dip in and out of ketosis. I can eat carbs. I'm not going to feel lethargic from it and I'm not going to feel like any performance drips or performance uh, drop-offs if I, if I don't eat the carbs as well. So my body mm. is quite, quite well adapted to that. Nice. That's interesting to hear. So... I cycle in and out of keto and when I am coming into carbs after like a period of keto, I get really kind of, I get, the carbs hit me pretty hard. I get, I feel like pretty lethargic if I, after like a heavy dose of carbs. So, so you don't feel like a carb slowdown when you're on keto, when you just, when you have. Not necessarily like if I'm eating like whole food carbs, like potatoes, rice and some tubers and some fruit or something, then uh, I don't feel any different at all. The only, you know, potential danger to that may be that if I'm eating some processed carbs, like pizzas or ice cream or such, then I may definitely feel lethargic. But I think that that kind of uh, mental fatigue and uh, slowness doesn't come from the carbs. It comes from the like the processed foods and the gluten or whatever else that you know, I may have been consuming. Fair enough. Fair enough. For instance, if I started it, if I started doing it the first times a few years ago, then at that time I did notice like the first times I did it, there was like the next few days I was kind of brain fogged and uh, really, really slowed down. But uh, after having done it for me like several times in a row and maintaining this sort of a uh, flexibility, then uh, I would say that it goes away and you w- will definitely like overcome that. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I think the times where I usually just am on keto and I'll just sort of haphazardly break keto is, I mean, for example, yesterday, one of my uh, office, my colleagues had a birthday and I just felt like I had to have a slice of cake just to celebrate with her. Uh, and then after that slice of cake, I was like, oh, man, <laughs> I want to take a nap for 30 minutes. Um, so that is real. If you are on keto and you take like a big lump of sugary carbs, you know, very refined carbs there, you're going to get that insulin spike and crash, which will make you probably pretty lethargic. You do notice like if you're on keto, then you kind of f- become more intuitive and more mindful about your blood sugar levels by default as well. You're not going to even need like a glucometer to measure your ketones or measure your glucose. You're going to feel intuitive intuitively okay based upon your like mental state and the focus like okay what kind of a what kind of fuel am i burning at the moment and yeah in the past from the past i could say that for instance if i were from in some sort of a restaurant i'm eating some sort of soup then i can taste 
okay, the, my blood sugar is going to be jacked up a little bit just because there may be some potatoes inside the soup or something and I'm going to feel slightly different. I agree. I think it's like, I feel like, you know, five years ago or like, you know, seven years ago when I was just like a computer science student at Stanford, right? this is like 10 years ago at this point now, I would have felt like you're, you're like, talking nonsense how do you intuitively feel your blood sugar now you know what i mean like i'm a skeptic by nature but now after actually being in tune with your subjective performance and being thoughtful around diet and really being thoughtful about it like you can actually tell like, and i think it's like a lot of people i think from the other side are like oh you guys are just kind of like talking woo woo or like you guys are just kind of uh bsing here it's like uh, uh, maybe or maybe not but there's something that you can actually feel. It's like, it's a real sense of like, I feel a sugar crash coming versus, you know, I feel really, really sharp. I'm, I'm in ketosis, I'm in flow. Um, but talking more quantitative or something that's more measurable, I'm curious to hear about um, different biomarkers you've measured while intermittent fasting or on keto. And then just from like a body composition perspective, I mean, I think the most obvious thing that I found in my own body comp is that I'm just, it's so much easier to be lean and cut on keto and intermittent fasting. Um, like I'm visibly just more fit looking than I was, you know, two, three years ago. Curious to hear about all the different, uh, you know, interventions aside from the subjective, like, you know, mental state uh, that you've had from, from, from intermittent fasting and or keto from like the basics of uh, biomarkers i would say that the, my blood glucose is definitely more stable throughout the day and uh, it's tends to be even like uh, slightly lower than normally so to say that I, I do notice that most people who do keto and fasting then they're like the baseline blood glucose for them is going to be slightly lower and they're not going to feel like hypoglycemic from that either so their their bodies you know burning glucose or the burning ketones and the, the demand for glucose kind of gets lowered and they don't feel hypoglycemic whenever they skip a meal yeah. or they don't get they, they don't get dizziness you don't get hangry exactly in the yeah. past i may have during high school or something i may have had like this short episodes where you know you you stand up too fast from the ground while laying down and you start to feel dizzy a little bit if you haven't like eaten anything for a few hours but now nowadays that you know never happens that and i ne never feel you know uh hypoglycemic or i don't never feel dizzy or i don't feel lethargic during the day my kind of brain is always you know running on ketones and uh, it's really really amazing uh, for that uh what i do think as well is that you know, yeah, the kind of the baseline for hypoglycemia will also be lower after you keto adapt. And even on my like longer extended fasts, my blood sugar is like really low in the 50s or something. And that's going to be medically categorized as hypoglycemic and I should be hospitalized. But, yeah. you know, because of my ketones are going to be elevated, I don't feel any different. And it's like an amazing feeling. 100%. When I did longer fast, yeah, my blood sugar would be down to like 60 milligrams per deciliter and for a doctor to see someone walking out with 60 milligram deciliter you're probably oh yeah you're hypoglycemic something's wrong with you we gotta pump you full of sugar and like and and it is kind of funny to realize that hey like you know doctors have i think again i don't you know very well trained and what they're supposed to do but if you're kind of deviating from um a standard western diet which is engineered to destroy your metabolism um uh, they're almost at, at, at a loss of how to characterize you which is something that hopefully biohackers you know folks in our communities can you know can can start shifting the culture shifting the education around what is even a healthy metabolism look like most of the kind of ranges for all the biomarkers are also established on the western diet so to say and uh, they're going to be drastically different for some people who are doing, you know, a low carb diet or something. There is this viral video, uh, f photo on Twitter where the mannequins at this mall were fat people. And, 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 and not to fat shame, but it, it, I think it is important to realize that that is a, would have, that would have been a morbidly obese model in 1800s, 1850s. And it is somewhat concerning for me to see that that is just the norm of how to sell clothes now. Um, there's no, you know, there's no, you know, there's no reason for us to shame or not shame anyone, but it just, I think concerning from a population health level 
to just see that, okay, we've just shifted our standards of what we expect to be normal to be someone that is morbidly obese. I think that's problematic as a society and as a healthcare system. And I think like the biggest kind of danger to that is as well that uh, the people who justify being fat or something, then they may not be operating from the perspective of their you know, truest self, so to say, that, you know, they may be simply addicted to food. So, and they kind of rationalize it away that it's, it's okay, it's who I am. Whereas in reality, their brain, it might be like hijacked from the processed food or the microbiome may be like telling them lies, <laughs> in a sense, which may sound like woo as well, but, you know, it's still like uh, there is some truth to it that, you know, processed food is addictive and it can definitely change the uh, mental powers and the decisions of a lot of people. You know, the processed foods are engineered to be addictive and yummy and say, you know, and, and get you to keep buying. So uh, there's very smart people in the food industry. You know, we've looked in, you know, we've, as you know, H3 men, you know, makes consumables and there's, yeah, smart people just trying to, you know, sell you stuff. And hopefully there's, you know, folks that, you know, realize that that's not something that's something that, you know, makes you proud at the end of the day. And can we help be, make people better and healthier as opposed to just getting them addicted to your product? Um, yeah, and I think from a, I, I think one thing that's interesting that you touched upon is that the synergy of intermittent fasting and ketogenic diet, most of the conversations I've had with people really keep them separate. Um, but I think it's a point worth underlying that these are very much related techniques. Intermittent fasting is essentially eating your own body fat or fasting is basically eating your own body fat. And the ketogenic diet is basically, instead of eating your own body fat, you eat exogenous fat as your primary uh, metabolic substrate. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's a, a point worth like, like doubling down for our audience here where, you know, intermittent, intermittent fasting or fasting stacks really well with the ketogenic diet. And I think if you really want to double down on the metabolic pathways that are triggered through either fasting or keto, it's it's really good. it's really synergistic to stack them both together. Yeah, I would say that you know the reason you would want to combine them is that um, the the physiology of fasting is really like therapeutic for the body and it helps to heal it from the inside out and it also like has many other longevity boosting benefits. Like you know one of the m main kind of trendy topics is autophagy mm -hmm. and uh, it it is like very very ramped up during the fast state or like during energy deprivation. So the reason if, if you are doing keto, then you can also, you will naturally, you know, potentially you will be eating less frequently and that's going to help, help you to, you know, gain more of the autophagic benefits and you're going to be able to fast for longer and much more easily without suffering from like the sugar cravings or not suffering from hunger. So you would nat naturally be adopting more of a, like a fasting focused lifestyle and it's going to be much more easier for you. And in so doing, you will like indirectly gain like the longevity boosting benefits from uh, fasting and uh, autophagy and uh, those sorts of things. I mean, I think one of the, you know, the longevity pathways like mTOR, right? They sense protein. And when you're fasting, you're obviously not ingesting any proteins. You're, you're mitigating mTOR activation. And the same thing is mimicked on a ketogenic diet. So yeah, as you're talking about, you're, you're hitting the same pathways. Like a keto diet is like a moderate protein type, type of diet. You're not consuming a bunch of carbs. You're not consuming like a bunch of protein. And uh, that itself is also going to help you to keep your mTOR uh, moderate, so to say. They say that, you know, meat and, M and protein are going to stimulate mTOR and that's going to accelerate aging. But at the same time, there are th other things that uh, activate mTOR as well, like glucose and insulin. Those yeah, are another carbs. one of those things that yeah, actually yeah. activate mTOR a whole lot. And yeah. especially if you combine uh, the glucose with uh, protein together, then that's going to spike insulin even more than uh, just eating protein alone in a low-carb yeah. setting. So on a keto diet, you're actually experiencing much lower levels of IGF-1 and much lower levels of mTOR just because you're like eating less frequently and you don't have like excess insulin and excess glucose floating around in the bloodstream. Yeah, no, I'm a huge fa fan of fasting and keto. Um, but I can also see that, you know, it's not necessarily for everyone. I think it's always worthwhile to just give the parameters here. You know, have you seen people go too far down the line of keto or fasting? What have you seen in your practice and your community around, you know, what goes too far? I would say that the biggest kind of mistake people tend to make is that uh, they, fa they become like catabolic for too long. And the catabolism refers to like breaking down 
And uh, that's what you're doing essentially when you're fasting or if you restrict your carbs, you know, too long or too uh, often, so to say. And uh, that's simply going to eventually degrade the body to a certain extent. And uh, I would say if you're starting to lose muscle, lean muscle mass from doing too much fasting too often or being on a keto diet for too long, then uh, you may simply, it's not going to be worth it, so to say, because muscle is also very invaluable and vital for longevity. It's going to help, you know, stave off a lot of the uh, age-related diseases and it's going to make you more insulin sensitive, so to say. So mTOR isn't like a bad thing. You would want to have mTOR uh, for, you know, maintaining lean muscle mass and actually mm -hmm. building muscle. So uh, I would say that if you are practicing intermittent fasting and keto, then you should never like be afraid of properly refeeding and uh, becoming like so scared of eating protein or so scared of eating meat and uh, scared of getting kicked out of ketosis because those things may actually have like a beneficial effect on your longevity by, you know, making you more insulin sensitive for a period of time and uh, helping you to increase your physical performance, build muscle, build strength and you have to kind of simply know when to stimulate mTOR at the right time and uh, make sure that you actually, you know, <laughs> feed yourself every once in a while because the body, you know, the body will fu fun function best when it's, when it's in homeostasis. Yeah, it's fasting, not starving. It's I called think. like intermittent fasting. So you're doing it intermittently and then you feast in a sense. And that's the, like the perfect combo. You know, that circles back to, you know, a topic that I've been underlining more recently, which is that longevity in of itself is sometimes orthogonal to performance. And in, in, in a sense that if you're trying to win an Olympic gold medal, you're probably not doing things that are optimal for longevity and vice versa, right? And and I think we all as individuals with our own baselines and our own goals, you need to understand what our, our individual goal is and then optimize our balance of longevity and performance. And I think for me, uh, I'm never going to be an Olympic champion in, in anything, but... I do like functional strength, function, you know, just being, you know, upper desk, you know, upper quartile in terms of fitness and in terms of like running, in terms of my, you know, calisthenics and all of that stuff. So I like the performance aspect of being strong, but I also like I'm trying to optimize for productivity, my cognitive performance and my longevity. So it's finding that balance of that that works for my lifestyle and i think that's going to be different for everyone you know for you that might be you know more focused on longevity and more focused on performance and for you know someone training for an iron man that might be more focused on performance and less on longevity um but i think it will be it would be a service to the broader discussion if we just had uh these two dimensions of this health space uh, just more clearly defined. Because I think people are like, oh, we, we want better performance. Like, what, do you want to live longer or do you want to perform better? Uh, you know, like, obviously, if you're just jacking up steroids of testosterone and growth hormone, that will make you win. That will make you perform better, but it will probably lower your health span, lifespan, right? And it's just like, that might be a trade-off that an individual might want to make. But it's probably a very slim portion of the audience. And someone that might want to be doing heavy caloric restriction, heavy dietary restriction for that chance to maximize their longevity, but then they'll be, you know, very low lean muscle tissue, somewhat emaciated, maybe not living a very happy life. That might be optimal for that specific person's lifestyle, but that probably is also a very small slice of the population. And I think we need to have a education or a culture to allow people to understand where they are and what their goals are and how do we help them get to their goals. You kind of pointed out very, very well that, you know, there's a, both ends of the spectrum. Like, for instance, on one end, you have, you know, uh, some bodybuilder, pro bodybuilder who takes steroids and eats too much protein, too many carbs all the time and six, six, six to eight, eight times a day. On the other hand, you have this sort of a starvation victim. So that they're always both on the extreme ends of the spectrum. And the kind of longevity or the, the best of both worlds is somewhere in the middle. Like uh, you probably won't be you won't be winning the Olympia uh, if your plan is to like live long time, but you may still get like at least like eighty percent of the results if you do things right and if you kind of commit to it uh, wholeheartedly, so to say. And yeah, it's 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 really important to kind of educate people about how does these different you know biohacks or these different nutritional interventions how do they affect their longevity in the yeah. long term because you know. The conventional fitness advice is to eat six times a day with frequent snacks and you know make them all low low fat and higher in protein and such 
But uh, what they don't tell you is that that may not have like a pro longevity benefit on them uh, just because of like stimulating mTOR quite frequently and mm-hmm. uh, you know maintaining this anabolism and not, not going into autophagy and such. So that's going to be like a really <laughs> detrimental situation. It's going to be simply like people aren't aware uh, that uh, what they're doing to their bodies uh, completely, and that's simply like a mis- uh, that's like quite unfortunate in a sense. And in the, in terms of like longevity and performance, then I would say it's it follows somewhat of a, like a U shaped curve. And uh, there, there there are studies that show that you know uh, the the mortality risk of IGF-1 also follows like a U-shaped curve mm-hmm. where uh, too, too little IGF-1 is going to increase mortality and too much IGF-1 is going to increase mortality as well. So the, kind of the best spot to be is somewhere in the middle in the kind of slope of the U-shaped curve. And I think that's where it gets complicated and nuanced because we all have our own you know, genetic bile signature in terms of what is that perfect spot for each of us and exactly you know, where are our goals and where we want to be dialing it. Um, what are, other, you know, I know you've been studying and, and you're working on a book around uh, intermittent fasting autophagy. I mean, what do you think are... I think our audience here is relatively up to speed on the concept, on the practice, on some of the key biomarkers. What do you think is the least understood in the fasting space? One of the few things that I already mentioned, like making sure that you refeed properly and not being afraid of eating protein, that's one of the things that most people tend to be afraid of. Uh, But secondly, also that it's quite misunderstood uh, how certain macronutrients affect the process of autophagy and uh, being in a fast state, so to say, that it's very you know, popular to be putting like, different flavorings and uh, you know, oils and butter into a coffee. And the idea that is it going to break a fast or is it going to maintain autophagy, those are very complex in my, in my opinion. And uh, the, whether they actually break a fast, this kind of depend upon you know, uh, how much calories are you actually consuming? Yeah, maybe we should dive into that because I think we get a lot of those questions. I get a lot of those questions as well because we run, you know, a big fast community called We Fast, and people ask about, can I put, you know, can I put a little bit of sweetener in it? Can I put a little bit of cream in it? Can I put butter in it? Can I put, you know, can I have caffeine? Can I have tea? Uh, you know, can I have amino acids in my, uh, can I have bone broth? Uh, curious to... I mean, I think each of those has their own nuance. So perhaps we should go down some of the popular crutches and talk about the uh, pros and cons. Let's start off like with bulletproof coffee and putting butter into your and into your coffees. Uh, I would say that you know whether it's going to break fast is going to depend upon the general nutrient status of your body and how depleted you are from certain nutrients. If you are coming from like a three-day fast then taking like 100 calories of butter in a coffee, I would say that it's not going to have like uh, any significant effect on autophagy or the fast state. But if you already ate the night before and you've been fasting only for like 12 hours, then that butter, that same amount of calories from that same amount of butter would have like a completely different metabolic response just because your body is, uh, has like, more, like a reserve from the previous day. And it's uh, going to have like a different effect, and it will probably like break autophagy to a certain extent. Uh, but there's also like like different types of autophagy, like chaperone mediated autophagy, which is more of like a selective form of uh, autophagy, and uh, that's going to potent. It can. It's, it's been shown that ketone bodies uh, stimulate that 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 process of autophagy. Mm-hmm. And uh, drinking that butter may r- raise your ketones, and in re- in turn, that can kind of maintain some form of autophagy. So it's always a, like a very complex situation of how depleted your body is from certain nutrients. How would exogenous fat, and then what mechanism would exogenous fat blunt autophagy? Exogenous fat still can elevate mTOR to a certain extent. So to say that uh, mTOR is uh, the main nutrient signaler or m- nutrient detector that switches you over from a catabolic state into an anabolic state. And the main nutrients that stimulate mTOR are uh, glucose, insulin, and uh, amino acids. But, yeah. but at the same time, too much fat is still like a source of energy that the body will detect, especially if it's like higher in calories. But if it's like a moderate amount of fat or moderate amount of calories, then that's not going to have like a, that big of a difference. So, the, so there's a difference between taking like 500 calories of butter or taking like only like 100 or 50 calories of butter. So the 50 calories may still 
maintain the autophagy to a certain extent, but if it's like 500 calories, then the body will simply... And, and then you're saying that the argument for you is that the higher amount of fat, there'll be some gluconeogenesis from that fat, and then that will trigger mTOR, and you're concerned about that? Even the high amounts of fat or high amounts of you know ketones, they may still raise insulin to a certain extent, just because it's like a nutrient that the body will try to store or try to mobilize in, in some form. I agree. I think the funniest thing when I hear people taking like a bulletproof coffee is that they're like, yeah, I'm not hungry. I just drank a coffee. And it's like, well, you just drank a thousand calories of butter for your breakfast. So of course you're not hungry. So I think it is easy to go fully into the kind of the absurd on the other side where you're like, you know, I think that the point of, you know, having a little bit of fat to start the day is, is sensible, but, and, and, and then maybe you reduce a, a breakfast, a, a meal with carbs and protein. But when you're just eat, when you're replacing with a thousand calories of fat and you think that that's just like a free meal that doesn't count as any calories, like, look, you just ate a thousand calories of fat. Of course, you're not hungry. Definitely less is more uh, and less is better in terms of the amount of butter or the amounts of fats you use. Uh, but at the same time, if, if the Bulletproof coffee helps you to kind of fast for longer and it helps you to like skip breakfast, then I would say go for it. Like uh, it's, it's, it's still like a matter of your, your, your own uh, choices and uh, what kind of a uh, situation you find yourself in. So, I mean, Bulletproof or, or butter and coffee, I mean, I think that's one thing. What do you think of caffeine? Uh, caffeine is a popular people th thing that people ask. Can I have a tea or coffee with, with fasts? Um, and usually, you know, I can, I can start off here. Usually we say that caffeine is not going to break a fast. Um, but I think there is, you know, reasonable argument that you not want to have anything aside from water from a fast. But I think in terms of just general understanding of mTOR, uh, IGF, you know, some of the, you know, signaling pathways, caffeine doesn't affect those pathways. So, you know, in that sense, caffeine is okay for not breaking a fast. Yeah, I agree that coffee is perfectly fine, whether that be like, yeah, from caffeine from tea or coffee. And uh, it, it's actually shown that, you know, caf coffee stimulates some form of autophagy and it does like stimulate ketone body production as well through like increasing lipolysis and such. So uh, coffee is perfectly fine in my opinion. Uh, the only problem is that if you're drinking too much coffee, then it may simply like raise cortisol too much and that may like raise blood sugar and insulin and such. So you would have to make sure that you don't drink like five cups of coffee or something. Uh, I myself tend to stick to only like one to two cups of coffee a day and that's like perfect, perfectly fine. And I think for me, when people just go cold turkey, they go from coffee, breakfast, everything to just straight fasting. It's really, really hard because you're not just addicted to insulin and carbs, you're also addicted to caffeine. So cutting all of those things at once is going to be going to give you a headache. There's also the argument that uh, uh, coffee is going to stimulate some of the liver enzyme processes and that's going to put you into like a fit state. Uh, but I would say that it's not going to matter at all because, uh, you know, although you may stimulate the liver's enzyme, you're still going to maintain a, a catabolic state, so to say. You're still going to be in a fast state because you don't haven't consumed any like real calories. Right. And it may it may actually be better from like the circadian rhythm aspect because if you do drink the caffeine in the morning, then you're going to offset the circadian rhythm properly and you're not, you're not going to misalign yourself from it. Whereas if you skip it altogether and you drink just water, then you may suspend your metabolism to a certain extent and you keep your liver in this sort of a suspended state all up, all, all up until the point where you're about to eat. Assuming that you're used to having caffeine, right? Because if you don't have any, any caffeine, then... Uh, then you, you don't have the suspension state that you're probably referencing. Um, how about amino acid bone broths? Uh, so my opinion on amino acids or bone broth. So amino acids, as we had discussed, trigger mTOR. So I would refrain from too much bone broth in amino acids. Although, you know, Dr. Jason Fung, a well-known fasting doctor, will recommend bone broth. And his argument there is that it's, you know, somewhat satiating and like the, the benefits of helping someone sustain through a fast is better than having a little bit of amino acid. But I, but I think that's a fair point. I think it's the same argument with caffeine or a little bit of butter in your coffee, you know, 
if it helps you stay on your fast, the probably the net benefit of extending your fast longer is better than having that little bit of extra nutrient. But I just want to, I, I think we should be clear to the listeners that, yeah, uh, I mean, bone broth has amino acids, amino acids trigger mTOR. You're going to blunt some of the benefit of fasting, but that's a, that's a, that's an option. Uh, but it is a trade-off that you have to make. It matters only depending on like how long you're fasting for. If you're fasting for several days, then having that bone broth is going to be pr- probably a good idea because it helps you to fast for longer and, you know, get some more electrolytes and actually get some, you know, more, a, a little bit of more of the nutrients into yourself as well. So you're not going to go into like the full on starvation mode. <laughs> yeah. But if you're fasting only for maybe less than a day or eating only... Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's not yeah. going to be like a matter... It's not going to be that significant and uh, it's not going to be important. But in terms of like breaking autophagy, then I would say that, again, in the example of longer fasts, then that small amount of amino acids, they may inhibit autophagy for only like a brief moment, uh, only for the time duration where you're digesting those amino acids. And after that, your body will probably go back into the autophagy quite rapidly. So it's not going to take an, an, another additional three days to trigger autophagy after drinking the bone broth because your body is already depleted from liver glycogen. And uh, yeah, it's running low on these nutrients. So, Have you tried ketone esters? Have you tried exogenous ketones? How, I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. Obviously, at HVMN, we have a ketone ester that is, is popular. Curious to hear your thoughts on, does, do, do you think that is breaks a fast and also just opening up the discussion broadly what do you think of the applications of ketone esters i would say that um, the exogenous ketones as a like a pure in in their pure form they probably won't break a fast uh, and they won't like significantly affect these things as well uh, as long as you don't take like uh, several servings of them but you know the, the the problem is that most these exogenous ketones they're t- kind of combined together with artificial sweeteners and other like ingredients. So those in turn may like spike insulin to a little bit, and that's gonna probably interfere with the fast a, a little bit. Uh, but the ex- the ketone esters themselves, I would say that uh, they don't really affect the uh, autophagy process that much. They're simply like a fuel source that the body will have to kind of utilize in some form during the fast. But again, the same in the same example of maybe like taking butter in your coffee, it's going to, you know, uh, burn through those, uh, that source of energy, but it's not going to have like any, like, uh, it's not going to break a fast, so to say, technically. Yeah, obviously any sort of exogenous calories, like from fat or from ex- a ketone ester is going to, you know, halt lipolysis for a little bit because you have external energy that you're burning through. But is it triggering mTOR? Is it triggering some of these nutrient sensing pathways? Uh, you know, you know, as as far as we know, fats and ketones do not. So you're not breaking those uh, autophagy uh, pathways. The ketone bodies like beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, they actually stimulate some form of autophagy, like the chaperone mediated autophagy. Cool. Um, and I guess like broadly, just zooming out, like, have you played with ketones, exogenous ketones, ketone esters for uh, like performance use cases or, or, or anything in terms of just as a biohack broadly? I use them sometimes before, before working out. And I do notice that they definitely help to uh, at least, I, well, the, the thing is that um, in most cases I'm working on fast days and uh, that the, those exogenous ketones simply give me like a additional fuel source that helped me to you know perform better. Uh, but if I have eaten anything before that, and I already have like some nutrients in my system, then I would say that there isn't going to be like a significant difference. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my go-to uh, usage of those uh, exogenous ketones. That I I like them for the electrolytes specifically, and uh, they do. Uh, increase at least like the mental aspect of of a workout and they put you in the zone much more easily. And you're talking about ketone salts versus ketone esters or I mean I want to just disambiguate the two. Hey, I was talking to about uh, the ketone salts. I, I haven't used the ketone esters that much. We got to hook you up and then get your thoughts on that because I think uh, just to give you a sense like a ketone salt will get you to like 0.5 1.0 millimole BHB and then for a ketone ester we we get you up to three to five millimole BHB in, in, in that same period of time, which is a very material difference. That would be interesting yeah, to see. Wrapping up here, just, you know, last couple of questions. Um, you know, what, you know, I know that you're working on a book, you know, 
what what are your big projects for the rest of 2019? Who are you traveling? I know you, you hit up different conferences. You were just at the Metabolic Health Summit, which my colleague, Dr. Brianna Stubbs, was was there as well. Um, which conferences, what are your projects for 19? My current plans uh, as of now are there's going to be a biohacking conference in Riga, which is in Latvia, in uh, the end of April. That's where I'm going to be speaking. And then there's going to be another one called the Health Optimization Summit in summer, in August, if I'm not mistaken. And I'll be, I'll be there as well. And in October, there's going to be the Biohacker Summit in Helsinki. So I'll be speaking there as well. So those are the kind of my, at the moment, the go-to conferences that I'll be going to. I do have like my own uh, boot camps as well, planning to organize in Estonia, where we're going to do some saunas and uh, cold, cold plunges and uh, some lectures about fasting and uh, all, all the other fun, fun stuff. Obviously, you're, you're super passionate and knowledgeable of the space. And I think passionate about sharing your experiences and your learnings. Where do people follow you? Where do people find you? Xim Lund is my tag on all of the platforms like on YouTube, Instagram, and uh, my blog is also seamlund.com. So there's, the people can find me there. Seem awesome conversation. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, everyone. If you want to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit www.hvmn.com forward slash pod. Also, by writing a review on our iTunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com, we'll hook you up with $15 worth of HVMN store credit. Our last shout out goes to our listener survey, which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes that you find most valuable. So visit go.hvmn.com forward slash podcast survey. For that, it'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. So it's well worth the time. Until next time, study smart, train hard and live well.